we're talking about a five hundred thousand dollar donation. Yes. So what is that? What does it get used for? What will it do? So we received a five hundred thousand dollar donation from the National Park Foundation and the Arduris Foundation uh, to support the native fish program at Yellowstone National Park. Our name is Yellowstone Forever. We're the official nonprofit partner to the park and the philanthropic and educational partner. So we receive private philanthropy donations to the park. So we're so grateful for our partnership with the National Park Foundation because we're able to support the park. We provide about a million dollars of funding a year for this particular program for Yellowstone. And is this part of the million dollars for this year, or is this an addition? This, this, this is part of it. This is helping mm -hmm. us meet that goal. And the National Park Foundation, as part of its centennial campaign, has made a commitment to really lift up the national parks. And they've actually raised $500 million so far for parks across the nation. So we're really grateful at Yellowstone Forever and, of course, at Yellowstone National Park to be a beneficiary of this tremendous campaign that National Park Foundation is working on. So why fish? Fish are critical to the, the history and the experience of Yellowstone with the introduction of non-native fish, as you probably know, the lake trout. Um, the Yellowstone cutthroat trout, the native fish in the area, just completely plummeted. And it's been very important for us because there are cascading impacts when you have a, a, such an important fish like the Yellowstone cutthroat trout that plummets in population. It has impacts with osprey, with bears, with beavers, and with other wildlife in the area. So what we did is we wanted to partner with the park on this program to restore the native fish population to help them raise the funds they need, uh, which we've done and we've uh, for many, many years. And what we've actually seen is a tremendous success. Now, I understand that there is one person who's primarily behind this gift. Can you tell me a little bit, I, I don't know if they want to remain anonymous or not, uh, a little bit about what motivated them? Um, the Argers family, they are very um, active in the angling community. They love to, to fish. Fly fishing is a passion for them and actually um, Julia started a, a fly fishing program for women in Idaho to try to get more women anglers and more women outside you know, experiencing the beauty of, of fly fishing, especially of course in, in this area. It's breathtaking. So I think that is where the passion came from, uh, but the reality is they're strong supporters of conservation in the national parks. And of course, through the National Park Foundation, they were able to connect their interest with such an important program at Yellowstone National Park and to find us, Yellowstone mm -hmm. Forever, because we too have a very ambitious campaign for Yellowstone National Park. We're looking forward to celebrating the parks. Uh, 150th anniversary in 2022, just pretty amazing, yeah. the world's first national park. So we're on an ambitious fundraising campaign as well, specifically for Yellowstone. So has she fished in the park? Um, I'm actually not sure about that. I, I, I mm -hmm. don't know, but I know there's a deep passion there. Mm -hmm. um, Todd, uh, Todd Cool was, was talking to me about my personal experience. I had been in the park in the late 90s, 98, 99, and talked to him about um, how easy it was to catch cutthroat trout on Yellowstone Lake. Then I moved to Montana in 2006, and I wondered, where did all the trout go? Right, right, what right. happened here? Yeah. Have yeah. you heard stories like that? It, it, have, have people spoken to you about that? Absolutely, and there's actually a wonderful podcast that I recommend that the park puts on, again, with support from Yellowstone Forever, called Telemetry, where they talk about uh, the lake trout and the impact it had on the visitor experience, You know, like not being able to find the Yellowstone cutthroat trout. So many, many stories we hear every day. Now we're hearing the opposite. We're hearing people say how exciting it is to go fishing, and whenever they go, they see a Yellowstone cutthroat trout, and they're excited to see the native fish come back. It's, it's been a neat, it's actually been a positive story, as challenging as, as it was when you came back to Montana. We have good news to share. Well, that's, that's great. Um, Todd also talked about how this is an ongoing program. Of course, you can never mm -hmm. completely eradicate a fish species. Um, this is, especially with the, the lake trout over in, in Yellowstone, like not so much on some of the creeks where they can put up dams and weirs and things like that. But um, this is something that may have to go on forever. What kind of fundraising challenge does that prevent? It's a big, present, you know, it's, a hu it's a huge challenge, but the fact that we're able to show the population increasing in the lake, now the opposite, right? Mm -hmm. the, lake, the lake trout is now crashing. It's been great to be able to show those positive results. And I think people understand the importance that Yellowstone has with 
wildlife conservation and native fish is just right at the center of that. And the other thing I'd say is that Yellowstone Forever, we are always cognizant that the park's priorities are our priorities. So we sit down with the superintendent, a deputy superintendent, and ask, what are your key objectives? Where do you need the most support? So we take our lead from them with respect to, to fundraising. So it's a big challenge, it's a heavy lift, but it's one that we're thrilled and honored to be able to take on because it's a priority for Yellowstone. Do you get a little bit of donor fatigue when you're always there asking for the same thing over and over again? You know, it depends. For some people, yes, but for most people, the more they connect with Yellowstone, the more they want to connect with Yellowstone. I think that's one of the reasons that people are drawn to this place. It's like so many different experiences in one well, in 2.2 .2 million acres. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a remarkable experience and it's known internationally. So some people get fatigued, but the reality is most people are excited when they see the results. They're excited that they're in, you know, they can make an impact. And it doesn't have to be $500,000. I mean, obviously we're celebrating this gift and we're so grateful for it because it's a game changer for the park. But five, 10, $25 contributions to Yellowstone Forever or Glacier Conservancy, whatever the park is that you love or the National Park Foundation really can make a difference for the park. And that's something that is a challenge for us to educate people on. Mm. Is this a good motivator then to see a, a big donation like it this? It is, it is. And I think when, when people are motivated when they see other people give, it validates the program, it gets people excited about what's possible, and it really gives a little bit more wind in the sails of these phenomenal public servants we have working in Yellowstone. You know, sometimes they don't get the attention that they deserve for the groundbreaking research, the science that they're doing, and how they've really dedicated it them themselves and their life, move their families here for this incredible mission, and it's exciting for them too to see that their work is validated that way. What, what are the special challenges with fundraising for um, something that's kind of, it, it's a public institution, it's owned by yeah. the taxpayers already, um, and it would seem like, well, gee, there's government support behind this. How do, how do you deal with that? It's, we have to walk people through it, right? I pay taxes, and it's a national park. Why do I need to make a charitable contribution mm -hmm. to a friends group? And I think the reality is, is that the operational budget for Yellowstone is around $90 million, and the federal contribution to that is about $30 million. Um, the rest is made up for con uh, concessions contracts, right? The different hotels and general stores operating through the park. But then the rest, that critical gap, and what we would call the margin of excellence for the visitor experience, comes through private philanthropy. And that's through individuals. And I talked about, you know, five, ten, twenty-five dollar contributions. We have stores throughout the park, um, Yellowstone Forever bookstores, where you can join and become a supporter and stay connected to the park with our magazine, with our incredible digital channels that we're developing for the park. But also it comes through corporations and from family foundations like the gift we're talking about today. And it's a game changer for the park and for the visitor experience. I notice, uh, for instance, at the visitor center at Old Faithful, we have our list of corporate yeah. donors there, and once in a while we see the Toyota vehicles. Sure. Um, how is it that corporations are attracted to something like this, a program like this? You know, corporations are excited for many reasons. One is that it is an iconic experience. It is part of America, Yellowstone is. It's also very significant internationally in that literally it's the world's first national park. I mean, what an amazing thing in 1872. And yes, we know Yosemite was created before Yellowstone, but Yosemite was technically a state park, right? And so this was part of the Wyoming Territory, Montana Territories that created this incredible place. And I think the third is um, it's great for them to be able to not only help with the park mission, but also help us with their expertise. So, you know, in addition to Toyota, we've also worked with Canon and we have support from Michelin, for example, who is helping us with mobility and thinking through how do people move through the park. So there's just incredible ways, I think, for these different companies to um, live sustainability and give back and they're excited about it. And of course it reflects well on them because it is such an important place where people have a significant emotional tie. 
And so do you go to these corporations and, and ask them for their professional advice as well? We do, yeah, and, and uh, usually at the park's urging. It's not just mm -hmm. us. Sometimes, you know, internally, okay, Yellowstone Forever, we're dealing with this. What do you think? But we brought all kinds of different professionals together to help, for example, one of the initiatives at the park is to become the greenest park. You know, how can we be more sustainable in park operations? So that's been really helpful. Uh, Lamar Buffalo Ranch, for example, is off the grid. We have this terrific um, solar panel installation that Toyota helped us use, use used hybrid car batteries to you know be basically um, connect with the solar panel so it's just been a really that's a really great experience for example that we've done um, also we've asked them to help us think about how we can use new night vision cameras to track wildlife and study wildlife and I know Dan Staler in the park has you know connected with Canon um, on his ability to track wildlife through this technology. So there's been all kinds of neat ways, whether it's using their products, using their expertise. Um, we've had a social media team at Michelin, for example, come and brainstorm with us about how we tell the Yellowstone story and take it out to the world. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm talking about our national partners. We have a terrific gateway partnership. So we have support from all kinds of local businesses um, that uh, are delighted to be able to support the park because of course, the park is really critical to the economy in this region, so we're thrilled to be able to connect with them in the gateway communities. What's the future? What, what, what do you see as the big thing on the horizon? Oh, the big thing on the horizon. Um, two things. One is a, a policy issue that we will serve as a sounding board and as a resource for, mostly for philanthropy, is dealing with visitation in the park. That's not our expertise, but we could help the park bring people around the table. But what is our expertise and what is our big mission is to help the park create a new youth campus. If you've been up to Mammoth, you've seen the current youth center, which um, I think was built in the early 70s. It is not a very evocative, you know, inspiring building. Right, it is, you know, just think, it was basically my junior high school experience whenever I see this building. And what we wanna do is partner with the park and build a state-of-the-art building um, outside of Mammoth. And it is going to be a living building, so a net zero energy building. Mm -hmm. And our vision is that it is the Old Faithful Inn for this century, but it's a center for education, mostly youth education, to really connect that next generation with this beautiful, amazing place. So when you say Old Faithful Inn for this yeah. century, what, have you gotten as far as design? We have. We're close to design. It's on our website, yellowstone.org. You can see, if you look up Youth Campus, you can see the designs. They're really beautiful. Um, it's a $40 million project. We have tremendous support uh, for it, but we have a lot of fundraising to do. And so who supports something like that? Um, Anderson Windows, for example. We, I, I just got back from Minneapolis that they've made a million dollar commitment. Half of that is literally the windows that will go in the building and half is um, from their foundation to support the program. We've had several individuals that have made significant gifts. We've had um, support from Kohler, for example, from Toyota. Um, they have supported the, pro the project at a million dollars. So it's just, um, I'm sure I'm probably forgetting a dear friend who has uh, supported the project, but a lot of corporations, private foundations and individuals again to really, and there may be an opportunity for matching grants uh, for federal dollars, which we're looking into, but a lot of this will fall on our shoulders because even though it's a park priority, it's not necessarily where the funds will be directed given mm -hmm. the maintenance backlog, the issues with safety sure. in the park and all the other myriad of pressures that the park is experiencing. And then who runs the campus? That's to be determined. Right now, it'd definitely be a partnership with uh, Yellowstone, uh, Yellowstone Forever and the National Park Service. But what does the programming look like? How does that work operationally? We're still sitting down with the park and working with them. But it's pretty neat. We actually have what people are calling the Yellowstone model, where the nonprofit partner, Yellowstone Forever, is actually working with um, the education and interpretation uh, folks at Yellowstone National Park to come together and say, how can we do our educational programming together? How can we reach more people? If you, if you have a ranger-led tour on X and we have a tour on Y, you know, why don't we make sure people know the full suite of opportunities they have? So they can leave the park with a deeper knowledge and understanding of what they've seen and the history of it, the ecological significance, and why Yellowstone is so magnificent. And do you have a timeline? We do have a timeline. Our, our hope is to have at least phase one constructed by 2022, which is the 150th anniversary of Yellowstone. 
we'll see. It's ambitious, and uh, we're ambitious folks, and so were the people who created the park you know, <laughs> in 1872. And you know, every little bit does make a difference for the park. And um, as you go forward, do you see yourself looking at future partnerships, um, you know, like the one that created Yellowstone Forever? Oh, you know, that's a really great question. Uh, not right now. I think most of our partnerships we're thinking are, you know, an educational partner as we're thinking about youth programming for the park or what could be a technology partner for the park to get our message out to even more people. But we haven't really thought about that in a different context. Uh, we're two years into a merger, mm -hmm. so we're kind of focused on, you know, really getting Yellowstone Forever known in the gateway communities, known nationally as the key partner for Yellowstone. And again, the National Park Foundation has just been an incredible partner for us, not only as our organization has gotten off the ground, but of course as we're trying to meet our fundraising goals for Yellowstone. And just, just to finish up, I'd like to go back to the digital sure. efforts yeah. that you mentioned. We're finding in our business, digital yes. is the thing. Um, can you tell me a little bit, I, I mean, you, you mentioned uh, the site, but can you tell me some of the other efforts that you're Absolutely. making and where you're going with yeah, them? Yeah, yeah. We're, um, hopefully next spring, we're going to experiment with a couple online classes. The vision is that someone might be able to take a class on wolves before they come to Yellowstone or watch it on the plane, or if, you know, my experience was being in the car with my family, and I'm older, so I didn't have a you know, video DVD or has some, a handheld or something, but maybe the kids could watch a video about Thomas Moran and his importance of Yellowstone as they come into the park. So we're experimenting with that, but we have a wonderful, robust platform on Instagram. It's, it's you know, obviously, it's mm -hmm. such a visual media. <laughs> Yellowstone's a pretty nice place, so yeah. please follow us at uh, YNP Forever. We also are on Twitter, and Facebook has been a great way for us to get our message out. Because we know, as many people, I know if, you, if you're from this area, you're like, you think that everyone in the world has come to Yellowstone, especially you know July, August. But the reality is this is a bucket list experience for so many. And there's a lot of people that will never have the opportunity to come here. So we're hoping these digital platforms that we have can help us take the Yellowstone story out to the world. We do a lot of programming with the park. They're also on Facebook. We're trying to do more video as well to tell, tell the story. I was just going to ask, what do you think people are, what, what are you seeing that people engage with the most? You know, um, telling your stories. We did a wonderful campaign last fall where we said, tell your Yellowstone story. And we highlighted a picture of two sisters. I think they were in front of the Yellowstone National Park sign in Gardner uh, in 1955. And then there was another from 2015 when they came back, you know, uh, years, years later. So that was really special to talk about. Other people have talked about when they, you know, bust tables at the Old Faithful Inn, you know, when they were in their 20s and what a great experience it was. And other people talk about, you know, seeing bison for the first time and what a spiritual experience it was for them. So that sharing, kind of having that two-way relationship with people who love the park, we've found has been very meaningful. And we've also found the more people engage with us, even if they're not here, the more likely they are to give to the park and support the park in the future. Mm, great. It's a well, neat relationship. Best of luck. Thank you so great. much, John. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you.